Coming up on the Angus Report, how selecting cattle for your specific region could become easier in the future. Do you have a broadband internet connection? If not, you might qualify for USDA funds to get it. Drought is affecting several regions across the U.S. What does that mean for cattle producers? And we share information about the association's new feeder calf program, Angus Link. This is the Angus Report. Welcome to the Angus Report. I'm Bob Cervera. And I'm Clint Mefford. Today, we're talking about cutting-edge research on regional beef cattle genomic predictions. Jared Decker, an assistant professor at the University of Missouri, is working on region-specific genomic predictions. Decker is passionate about the work he's doing, and he explains why it's valuable to ranchers. It's all about matching the cow's genetics to the environment we're asking her to produce in. So, we really want to do this so that we make sure that that cow is as productive and as efficient as possible. If, she, if she's dealing with heat stress, if she's dealing with fescue toxicosis, if she's dealing with high altitude, she's not going to be as efficient and productive as possible. And so right now, when producers are trying to make those decisions, they don't really have any data to guide that uh, decision of does, does her genetics match the environment? We can do a really great job selecting on the genetics, but we can't add that second piece of the genetics by environment interaction. And so that's what we're working on. We have a large USDA grant, uh, and we're working on trying to create tools that help producers make these decisions about the genetics for the environment uh, more accurately. At the Beef Improvement Federation Conference in June, Decker gave an update on how the project is going. We're about halfway through the grant, and on the research side, we have basically four major projects that we're working on. So one of the projects that a lot of Angus producers have been involved with is our hair shedding research. And so basically what we're looking for is those cows who shed off their winter coat earlier and are better prepared to deal with the heat that's gonna come in the summer. So those cows that retain that fuzzy winter coat uh, tend to wean a lighter calf. And so it's identifying those cows that shed off earlier, so creating a genomic prediction for hair shedding. Other things that we're doing in that project is comparing uh, different populations of cattle in different regions of the U.S. and looking for signatures of selection in their DNA. So is there selection that's happened over the last 50 years that have made cattle in the Gulf Coast different from cattle in the Upper Plains? Then we also look for uh, DNA variants and genes that have a gene by environment effect, which means they have a big effect in one environment and little to no effect in a different environment. And then the last piece of the puzzle that kind of ties all this other information together is we create, instead of a national genomic prediction, we create a region-specific genomic prediction. So we'll have a genomic prediction specific to the Gulf Coast, a genomic prediction specific to the fescue belt, uh, specific to the Rocky Mountains, etc. He shares what he hopes ranchers will get from the research and what they should keep in mind. One of the things that I frequently hear is uh, they tried selecting on EPDs and the cattle just didn't perform in their environment. And, and so that, that does happen. Uh, right now we don't have great information, great data to help make that decision. And so producers are left either buying bulls locally, um, and so that really limits their ability to use some of those really superior AI sires. So that's one of our real hopes in this project is that we'll actually give people information and data uh, to make those decisions better. We always need to keep in mind that EPDs work. Okay? They do the job that we're asking them to do. What we're doing in this project is just tailoring those EPDs to specific environments to really provide more value to the producers. Decker's research is certainly interesting, and it has the potential to benefit ranchers across the country. On July 27th, the USDA announced a pilot program to help private investors bring broadband to rural areas. U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue said USDA seeks comments on its implementation of the e-connectivity pilot program. The Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2018 that was passed in March established the program and earmarked $600 million for funding. 
The Federal Communications Commission states 80% of the 24 million households in rural areas do not have reliable, affordable high-speed internet. The USDA's goal is to effectively use new and innovative funds. The comment period is open until Monday, September 10th, 2018. You can place your comments at regulations.gov or by mail and let your voice be heard. The $12 billion aid package for farmers and ranchers might be available as early as next month. The aid is in response to the hit many farmers and ranchers took from the trade war between the U.S. and China. USDA is the lead agency and will issue assistance through direct payments, commodity purchases, and U.S. export market promotions. USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue said the package would be available to soften the tariff's blow. The aid plan is only intended for this year's crop. Farmers and ranchers are required to submit their data on current crops, not crop history. Stakeholders have conflicting responses to the aid. Some say it'd be better to stay out of a trade war and only focus on cutting a trade deal. USDA will cut checks to farmers and ranchers who provided their yields sometime this fall. The yields must be based off actual production, not historical averages. Purdue said, quote, we want people to plant according to market signals rather than government programs, unquote. USDA does not want farmers and ranchers to make crop and production decisions based on temporary aid. Many consumers have misconceptions about antibiotic use in the livestock industry. But what about farmers and ranchers? Dr. Brian Lubbers, a clinical associate professor at Kansas State University, recently spoke at the Beringer Ingelheim Cattle First Stalker Summit in Springfield, Missouri. He said consumers and cattle producers can have misconceptions when it comes to antibiotic resistance in livestock. I think there are people that will use the term average consumer, so people that aren't involved in cattle production. Uh, the, the biggest one is always that, you know, they think that how we use antibiotics in animal agriculture is causing all of the antibiotic resistance issues um, that, that people are experiencing, that they're experiencing in human health. Um, but I see the flip side from, from people that are involved in cattle production. Uh, the misconception is, is that uh, the antibiotics that we use are different or we use them differently or we're so far removed from the human consumer that we're not leading to any of the resistance issues. And, and actually both of those are not true. And, and the truth is probably actually somewhere in the middle where uh, we do using antibiotics in cattle production, we do have some responsibility and we can create some issues down uh, later on either through the food chain or through the environmental spread of antibacterial resistance. So both for the reasons mentioned earlier that it can affect our ability to use antibiotics and, and the potential for contribution, um, we really need to, to use these tools cautiously um, so that we have them for a long time in the future. Lubber says by consulting a veterinarian, producers can learn to be good stewards of antibiotic use. Point number one is always more action with the veterinarian. I mean, as in animal health, the veterinarian is the one that's trained, you know, the pharmacology of it, the microbiology of it, um, knows about the production of that particular system. And, and I think that's one thing that's important to realize, too, is that we talk about antibiotic stewardship as if it's this big umbrella, one antibiotic stewardship program fits for everybody, and that's not true. So the veterinarian, the local veterinarian, the one that's familiar with your operation, is really the one that has the most information. You know, what, what does antibiotic stewardship or what does a particular program, which one is going to be the best fit for that unique operation? He also explains why producers should learn about new products and ways to treat animals. We have an antibiotic and maybe it's worked in the past or maybe it hasn't worked in the past. There are so many variables that are involved with that particular disease outbreak uh, that, and they change, right? They change over time. And so um, having somebody involved that, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's doing some diagnostics. Maybe it's a veterinarian can help you evaluate records to really do the, do the record, the treatment records support what your impression is as a producer with that particular drug or that particular disease. Um, Maybe there's something new, you know, maybe there's another tool out there that could be used rather than just grabbing that bottle of antibiotic. Um, maybe there's a new vaccine, maybe there's an alternative to an antibiotic. Uh, that, you know, the, the technology, the science, the new products, those are changing all the times. And I think we're kind of in this era where, you know, we're trying to get away from using more antibiotics and so there's there's kind of a, a gap there right now where we're seeing a lot of new companies and new things come in and, and I think having somebody that's in touch with that also to help you say, okay, this might be a good fit for your operation is really, really important. Consult your local veterinarian for more information on antibiotic use.
Stay tuned, the Angus Report will be back after this. Welcome back to the Angus Report. Today, our thoughts are with everyone who's dealing with exceptionally dry conditions this summer. Rachel Robinson has an update on the severe drought that's affecting more than 20% of the country. When the well goes dry, what's your backup plan? Mother Nature has dealt many ranchers a bad hand this summer, and many are wondering how to manage such a limited water supply. You might have to get creative, but there are options to keep your operation afloat. I would encourage producers to, uh, to make a plan to, to not let their cows lose body condition score or to consider early weaning their calves or to consider culling some of those bottom performers out of their herd and just try to basically um, rest their pastures to some extent over the next 60 days. If there's any non-productive females on the farm, they need to go. They either need to be nursing a calf or pregnant or some combination of the two, but identifying those non-productive females and taking them off of the off of the farm is a paramount importance during this time. Anything with bad eyes, bad feet, bad udders, um, bad dispositions, just everybody usually has some a call list that they're always looking for an excuse to get rid of, but they oftentimes when, when push comes to shove, don't. And so what I'm saying is any of these non-productive females, they really need to go because the cost to feed these cows currently based on where we're seeing hay prices go and where um, a lot of producers are giving 85 plus dollars a bale for hay, that really makes the math tough when they had usually counted on their pasture to provide you know, a large majority of the feed for their cows over the course of a production year. In a year like this, it's, um, it, to me, it's, it's pretty important to consider early weaning their calves because when we take a calf off of a cow early, we reduce her nutrient, the cow's nutrient requirements by 40%. And so one of the things I like to say is that every two and a half days that a calf is early weaned saves a day of feed for the cow. And that, knowing that, I think really sort of tips the scale for the producer in terms of thinking about maybe instead of trying to maximize profitability in times like this to minimize the losses. Look to your local extension for more information. We check in now on the latest cattle market news with our market update brought to you by Cattle Facts. Hello, I'm Marcus Bricks with the Cattle Facts update. On August 2nd, the USDA released their 2018 land value summary. United States farm real estate values, crop land values, and pasture land values all increased on average between $40 and $60 an acre versus a year ago. Farm real estate, which is a measurement of the value of all land and buildings on farms, averaged $3,140 an acre, with Corn Belt real estate selling at an average of $6,340 an acre. Crop land values averaged $4,130 per acre, which is equal to the 2015 annual average, the previous highest on record. Pasture values set a new record average price at $1,390 per acre, which was a 3% increase over last year. Regionally, the weakest growth took place in the Great Lakes and Pacific Northwest, where pasture values were unchanged on average. The states lining the Central Plains highlighted the most growth north and south. In Southern Plains, pasture values from Oklahoma and Texas were on average 4.1 and 6.1% higher, respectively. Kansas pasture values were unchanged versus 2017, but surrounding Missouri and Nebraska showed annual growth of 6.6 and 8.6%. Nebraska pasture values were priced over $1,000 for the first time on record, at $1,010 per acre, an $80 per acre change. Land values are, only, are determined not only by the productive value of the land, but also by the long-term value of a finite resource with increasing demand. The cow-calf segment of our industry has been, on average, profitable every year since the beef demand lows in 1998. In order to grow in the cow-calf segment, producers need to invest in cows and land to expand their herd size. This requires profit to reinvest or borrowing on credit. Based on estimates from the Calfax Cow-Calf Survey, it took roughly 50% more capital to operate in 2017 than it would have just 10 years ago. Interest rates have been historically low and little changed following the recession in 06, but are now expected to increase incrementally through the end of 2019. Low interest rates could mean producers 
or low interest rates meant producers could restructure and service debt with little change to the loan interest rate. Going forward, rising interest costs will present a challenge to agriculture and could affect the level of demand for investments in the near term. Thank you for supporting Cattle Facts. I'm Marcus Bricks. To learn more about Cattle Facts, your leading source for beef industry market information, visit cattlefacts.com. Next on the Angus Report, Angus Link Director Chris Engel has an overview of the American Angus Association's new feeder cattle program. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Angus Link is a new feeder cattle program that brings the world's most comprehensive genetic database to America's cow herd. Angus Link's director, Chris Engel, has details. The requirements to enroll are easy. We developed the program for the commercial cattlemen. Uh, sire requirements, 50% of the bulls used to sire the calf crop need to be registered Angus bulls. Up to 25% of the bulls can be registered with any other breed association. And then no more than 25% of the bulls can be non-registered bulls. All we'd need for the non-registered bulls is a basic breed composition. Let's just say 20% Hereford, 80% Angus. We also require cow information. We need the total amount of calving females annually, and we need the breed composition of those cows. If you provide bull history that has uh, contributed to the genetic merit of that calf crop, we can more accurately reflect what the genetic makeup of those cows is, and that would improve the cow side contribution to that calf score. We need basic information about the calves, how many you're going to enroll, as well as the predominant coat color of those calves. That helps us determine whether or not they'd be eligible for any Angus branded programs. You get a tag to identify to uh, any potential buyers in a sale barn that this is an Angus Link enrolled calf or a group of calves. They get a marketing certificate, which they can document uh, expand upon their health protocol to uh, advertise to any potential buyers what those calves have received. The marketing certificate will also include mention of any process verified programs like Angus Source that they may also be enrolled in. The biggest thing is the Angus Link scorecard. It contains the three scores for the program, beef score, feedlot performance score, and grid score, and they show to any potential buyers the pro genetic performance potential of those calves. The beef score is founded on dollar B, the feedlot performance score is founded on dollar F, and the basis of the grid score is dollar G. So the beef score is a kind of a combination of both quality uh, carcass value as well as feedlot performance. The feedlot performance is looking at things like average daily gain and feed efficiency, and then the grid score is based on more uh, carcass quality EPDs, marbling, ribeye, fat. So for the commercial cattlemen, Angus Link is going to be a platform where you can track and benchmark genetic progress in your herd to make sure your next calf crop is better than your last calf crop. For the feeder, it's a way to have another piece of information about the cattle that you could potentially buy. The cattle that have the inherent genetic ability to perform in order to meet their marketing objectives. A way to manage risk. You can manage what you can measure, well, now feeders have the ability to measure the genetic performance potential of calves they can buy. For more information, go to our website, www.angus.link.com. Tune in to the Angus Report next week when we go more in depth about Angus Link and what it can do for your operation. For many producers, faith plays a large part in their lives. However, for Father Patrick Boland, his life revolves around faith and the cattle farm at Subiaco Abbey in Subiaco, Arkansas. There, the monks pray and work together, just like their Benedictine motto says. beings are body and soul. You know, we take care of our bodies, we take care of our souls as well. What attracted me to the Benedictines was their balance of work and prayer. We have a cycle throughout the day of where we have specific times of the day that we pray together, either privately or in community, and then there's times that we actually do various work. 
And the bells tell us, if you heard the bells, the bells tell us what time it is so we know what activity is next. <laughs> we don't, a lot of us don't wear watches. <laughs> All the monks wear several hats. One of my assignments is on the farm. I've always used my hands my entire life. My father's in construction. So I'm a laborer, you know? I'm the guy that picks up the sticks and fixes the fence and feeds the cattle. And I help move them, of course. And uh, I enjoy that. Long before I got to the monastery, I was looking for land. I was gonna actually have beef cattle, a commercial farm. I could never work that out exactly. And then when I came out here for a private retreat, I had no idea I was gonna be joining this. And I didn't even know they had cattle when I came out here. When the monks first came here in the late 19th century, the abbey had a farm for sustenance. You know, they grew their own vegetables and plants and they had hogs and they had chickens and they had cattle for their own table. In uh, 1999, the Abbey uh, moved into the registered Black Angus current cattle operation we have. Uh, we have close to 300 head on the property right now. We're in a farming community. Everybody around us has, has farms. One of our former abbots, Michael Lensing, was instrumental in founding the Subiaco Co-op that's downtown. And uh, that keeps us connected very deeply to the entire agricultural community of the area. It's, uh, it's interesting living with 40 men, you know? Uh, there's this rose-colored vision of the monks with their hands prayered in all day like this in silence, but that's not the reality. We're human. We have to interact with one another. We humble ourselves to what others need or what they're feeling today, being compassionate for one another. While I can be frustrated with a particular monk on a particular day for something he did, he's still gonna be down there at prayer with me at 5.30, praising God and praying for the whole church. So we have the same goal, we have the same mission. That's what makes us grow together and bond to one another. I think that interaction is what makes us holy. God works in mysterious ways. I ended up being in the cattle business without even trying to be in it. I believe that by producing the best quality cattle, we put better meat out there for people to eat. I know that the beef industry is going to contribute to feeding the world. It's pretty amazing that Angus cattle are a part of an abbey. Well, the Angus breed bridges so many walks of life. It really know. does. That's all for this week's Angus Report. We'll return next week at this time for more cattle news and highlights. Now, in the meantime, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Angus TV, for more from the association. Thanks for joining us.